Hello all, and welcome to Race Report number three. Here we talk about, by request, the 1966 12 Hours of Sebring, a rather different race than that which ran the previous year. As with the other videos so far and upcoming in this series, none of the footage or photographs are my own, and I have uploaded the supercut of the original newsreel and home video footage I was able to find on the channel for further reference. Hope you enjoy. The 1966 12 Hours of Sebring, held on the 26th of March 1966, was a race of wonderful highs and terrible lows. Now into the third year of Henry Ford II's personal vendetta against Il Commentatore, after the collapse of the negotiations for Ford to acquire Ferrari in 1963, the Ford Motor Company's GT40s were finally coming into their own after a rather disastrous 1964 and a 1965 of only middling successes. After starting the 1966 season with a 1-2-3 finish at the first 24 hours of Daytona, previously called the Daytona Continental, Ford prepped what can only be considered an automotive blitzkrieg to finally take an outright Sebring victory and gather as much experience and data as possible before a third attempt at Le Mans. To this end, Ten cars run by five factory-supported teams were entered, including an unusually prototypey prototype in the X1 Roadster, run under the auspices of Shelby American Racing. Three additional GT40s were entered by private teams, although still receiving technical support from Ford in a manner similar to the previous year through the provision of unaffiliated consultants who were mysteriously competent on Ford products and spent most of their time hanging around Ford-run garages. In all, 22 Ford or Ford-powered vehicles were entered for the race, out of 82 total, of which 18 took the start. The X1's prototypiness came from its featuring a fully aluminum chassis and body, something that would have, and hopefully did, please Mr. Eric broadly, no roof for further weight savings, an automatic transmission, perhaps inspired by the Chaparrals, and a whopping 7-liter engine shared with the new Mark II GT40s to obviate those weight savings. All things considered, the X1 was, at least on paper, the car to beat. The rest of the GT40s were a mix of the newer and more powerful Mark IIs and the original Mark Is, which featured a mere 4.7 liters of V8 power, although a couple of the privately entered Mark Is sported similar all-aluminum bodies to the X1, saving over 120 pounds versus the stock vehicle, or about 50 kilograms for our friends in metric lands. Here's team manager John Crowley for the Fords to talk about their strategies for the race. Will you assign lap times to your men? Yes, they will have lap times. Can you tell us who your rabbits will be and who your steady boys will be? Well, I think we'll have Dan Gurney out front. Uh, he set a new qualifying record, and uh, he's got a car with a lot of potential, and we'll have him out front. How about behind him? Who's going to be the slow one? Well, we'll probably keep uh, A.J. Foyt and... Uh, uh, the second uh, 4.7 liter car back uh, and let Graham Hill go out front too. However, Ford's plenitude of GT40s, a dramatic increase from the two entries of the previous year, was not the only notable change. The positively biblical deluge that became the defining moment of the 1965 race had also done its part to expose the need for facilities updates and safety improvements, helped by the other, sometimes related, incidents in which amazingly, no spectators or drivers were killed or seriously injured. The rather flimsy snow fencing that served more as a crowd control device than any safety measure was finally starting to be replaced, at least in some high-risk locations, with the chain link fencing that now surrounds all areas of the circuit. However, at many areas of the circuit, these safety features remained effectively non-existent, as we can see at this shot of the inside of the hairpin, where spectators are protected by some very impressive, incredibly strong single leftover tires, half buried in the ground, while they're standing, what, 15 yards away? Safety! More annoyingly, this was the year in which the scaffolding ban came into place, forbidding the construction of any scaffolding or temporary structure more than six feet or two meters tall, a ban that remains to this day, although it isn't universally enforced. On the happier end of things, a new vehicle bridge had been constructed, providing spectators with infield access to the area now known as Green Park, more than doubling the area available for drunken revelry and spring break shenanigans. 
Another consistent trait of the Sebring race was the remarkable delta between attendance and tickets sold. The plenitude of access roads and disused buildings meant that it was arguably easier to sneak in than to wait in the queues at the gates, and once the race got underway, the likelihood of getting caught was extremely low. The organizers were, of course, aware of this problem, and in the days leading up to the race when people were setting up campsites, not building scaffoldings, and generally enjoying their race weekend, they would send out large cordons of ticket checkers to try and close this ticket sales differential, usually with at least moderate success. But come the green flag on Saturday, the spectator areas did get a bit raucous to make such uh, attempts. Anyway, Ferrari was, as with the 1965 race, expressing a reticence regarding any factory participation in the race, and it took a visit to Marinello and Il Commendatore from Mr. Ullman in person, hat in hand and a bag of money likely hidden within it, to convince Signor Ferrari to send the most recent Ferrari P-car, the 330P3. Though the negotiations took the better part of a day, likely made somewhat frosty after the pasting that the definitely privateer Ferraris had received last year at Ford's and special invitee of Mr. Ullman's chaparral's hands, cool heads and cold hard cash prevailed, and two of the new P3s were committed to a Sebring entry, although some reports indicate that as many as five cars may have been promised. Hooray! Of course, what went unsaid during Mr. Ullman and Signor Ferrari's meeting was that the engineering and production of the new P3 car was well behind schedule, largely due to improvements being made over the previous year's P2 model. Given that Ferrari had a pathological dislike of simply increasing an engine's displacement to improve a vehicle's performance, other avenues had to be pursued. In this instance, the 4-liter V12 design with dual spark plugs and four overhead camshafts remained the same, but out had gone the six twin Weber carburetors, with a Ferrari V12 experiencing fuel injection for the first time, at least from the factory, this time with injection sourced from Lucas. An updated gearbox and clutch were specified, although the reliability of the gearbox remained suspect. A new body was shaped in the workshops of Pierre Drogo to improve aerodynamics, and in all, power output was reported at 420 horsepower at 8,000 RPM, although it's likely that this was understated and varied from car to car, as was typical of Ferraris at the time. In the end, one of the new P3s was prepared in time for its Sebring outing, driven by Mike Parks and Bob Bondurant, until this season a GT driver for Shelby. The second promised car was instead replaced by a 365 P2 run by Luigi Cinetti's ever-present North American racing team and driven by Pedro Rodriguez and Mario Andretti, who had recently achieved success in IndyCar racing but had yet to meaningfully break into sports cars. Ironically, after the Sebring race, he would hop over to a Holman and Moody run GT40 for Le Mans, his... Uh, Nart spot having been filled by the more experienced Richie Ginther for the French Endurance Classic after they received their 330p3. Though not as powerful or quick in a straight line as the GT40s and 330, the 365 had the advantage of platform maturity and therefore reliability, and was considered to be competitive for the final victory if the 1966 race should be particularly hard on the newer and more fragile prototypes. Rounding out the headliners were last year's winners, the Chaparral team. Rule changes had blunted their keenest edge, the lightweight nature of the 2A, by requiring a coupe body for all unrestricted prototypes and adding nearly 400 pounds to the vehicle's overall weight without a commensurate change in power output. This newfound obesity diluted the power-to-weight ratio sufficiently that the cars were no longer truly competitive, and they failed to break the three-minute lap barrier that they had obliterated the previous year. Let's hear from Jim Hall about the challenges they face going into this year's competition. We're, uh, we've had a little problems uh, during practice. We don't quite know how uh, competitive the cars are going to be, so we're really going to have to make it up uh, as we go. Uh, I think the 427 Fords are a little faster than we are, so uh, we'll kind of string along with them and see what happens. Will you assign lap times to the two cars? Uh, possibly after a couple hours running. We'll just have to see how quick the cars get. The other classes were filled with entrants as well including two entries from the increasingly involved Porsche Works team and their 906s, along with three private entries of the same type. Five 904s rounded out the Porsche contingent, also two factory and three private entrants, 
one of whom was sportsman, yachtsman, and occasional racer Briggs Cunningham. I say occasional racer, he'd only designed and entered Le Mans nine times, including two class wins and an outing with this bad boy. Class victory at Sebring in 1953 as a driver, outright victory for one of his cars, and two more class victories, with the most recent coming in 1964. He also co-designed and skippered the 12-meter Columbia to another successful defense in the 1958 America's Cup, continuing the long tradition of domestic dominion over the Cup. Happily, in this instance, it was through genuine sailing excellence rather than the occasional legal chicanery to which the vagaries of the deed of gifts language and the skill of the defender's lawyers occasionally gave rise. Anyway, back on dry land, the sole accepted challenge to the Porsches in the two-liter category came from a lonely little Ferrari Dino 206, driven by Lorenzo Bandini and Ludovico Scarfiotti, which are the sort of names Ferrari racing drivers should have. Team Penske was entering their second race after a debut at the 24 Hours of Daytona that year, with two modified and decidedly quick Corvette Stingrays competing in the GT 5-liter plus class. GT and Sports 1.3 and 2.0 filled the majority of the remaining entry slots, with the traditional large contingent of British automobiles taking the lion's share of the pit spaces, including Triumphs, Austin Healy's, MGB's, and a single Lotus Elan and Jag E-Type. Counterbalancing from the continent were four Alfa Romeo Giulias, two Alpine A110s, an Abarth, a Matra, and so on. You get the idea. Full entry list is on the WordPress link in the description below. Let's go over and get some insights from drivers across all classes about what makes the Sebring 12 Hour one of the most challenging races in the international competitions. Very, very difficult. It's just a grind, hard grind. Brakes and engine all the time. There's a lot of places where you get up to very high speeds and then you're breaking down to just five miles an hour virtually and it's uh, this is very very difficult the brakes get up 17 1800 degrees in temperature the first two bends past the pits are very difficult because they're the fastest corners on the uh, circuit and uh, fast, fast corners are always tricky uh, i think at night time it's uh, particularly difficult to find the apex of the corner especially with these rubber co cones because you suddenly sort of you line up in one of them and the next lap you come around somebody's tied it and it's not there anymore you can find yourself in difficulty. And this course is probably the most challenging in the world, uh, including Le Mans. I think Le Mans is easier than, than uh, Sebring. The surface is so rough, uh, the cars get taxed, the drivers get taxed a great deal more here than anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's tiring. You know, there's not an awful lot of rest here. You know, you work pretty darn hard. A lot of hard braking and all that sort of stuff. Our trackside experts, National Speed Sports News Editor Chris Economaki and former U.S. road racing champ Bob Holbert. Bob's logged over 10,000 miles on this course, winning six class victories in seven years, driving everything from Porsche to Shelby Cobras. Bob, what does it take to win? Well, Chris, first of all, it takes a good car and it takes a good driver. A driver has to know the capabilities of his car and himself, and he has to be able to set a 12-hour pace that he can maintain. It takes pit work and it takes teamwork. We have a team and a team manager, and most important of all, it takes good strategy planning by the team manager and the team. In the practice sessions before the race, one of either two or three, depending on reports, the new Ferrari 330 topped the charts early, finally breaking the three-minute barrier that had only last year been bested by the Chaparrals, while the X1 GT40 prototype struggled with its experimental auto box losing valuable practice time to get it sorted out and eventually necessitating a replacement with a standard gearbox before the race. Though the time lost was only the remainder of the first practice session, the greater loss was in the further work required to readjust all of the minor, unintended changes that occur following such a significant drivetrain rework. Ken Miles took responsibility for driving the car to address these readjustments, which meant that co-driver Jack Ruby had very little seat time prior to the start of the race. Combined with his minimal prior experience around the southern Florida track, especially given that in those days I guess there were no 12-axis movie theater-sized immersive simulators that cost more than a small hospital, this had a rather deleterious impact on his lap times under racing conditions. Eventually, the Mark II of once and future president, 
There's a line item in my contract that says he must always be introduced this way, just like John Hindoff now has uh, been, you know, calling those yellow Cadillac VR series cars gold at the request of the manufacturer. Dan Gurney and Jerry Grant got dialed in and managed to put in the fastest lap of the weekend to qualify on pole, a 254.6, knocking exactly three seconds off the qualifying time and lap record set last year by the Jim Hall Chaparral. Speaking of the Chaparrals, the aforementioned added weight did take its toll, and they struggled to replicate their performance from the prior year. On-track times were slower, handling was reportedly a handful, excuse the pun, and a bevy of reliability issues were cropping up, including oil leaks, electrical issues, and suspension challenges that were likely exacerbating the already light steering characteristics of the fiberglass-bodied cars. They sure did look good, though. Between the clean white livery and slightly more bulbous roofline that you got from the Ferrari or the Ford. That year, the practice sessions were joined by what many would now consider a fixture of most IMSA or World Endurance Championship weekends, a support race on Friday, the first of its kind for the 12 hours of Sebring, and the race itself was a new format introduced by the SCCA. Although we know it better today as Trans Am, and such events now have their own Sebring weekend, the original name for the race was the Trans American Sedan Championship. A four-hour race for modified production cars, there were two classes, over two liter and under two liter. I wonder where those uh, cars with exactly two liters of displacement were classed. Be that as it may, the race ran without serious incident. Uh, 26 of the 44 entrants finished with the fastest lap set by Bob Tullius driving a Dodge Dart at 3 minutes 30.8 and finishing second overall, finishing first in the over 2 liter class. Top honors went to an under 2 liter car, an Alfa Romeo GTA driven by Jochen Rindt, which won despite having been rolled the day prior, and the top five overall was rounded out with three more alphas. The fuel economy benefits of the smaller engines likely proved decisive over the four-hour duration of the race, along with the nippier performance on braking and in the turns, not dissimilar to the performance differentials one saw in touring car racing at the same time over in the UK when Minis and Cortinas battled it out with Mustangs and Mark II Jags for victory. Race day dawned, and with a much better weather forecast than the previous year, and lower temperatures than earlier in the week, the day of spectators arrived again in the tens of thousands. It was another year for record-breaking, and over 60,000 people are reported to have attended. Whether that number accounts for those who snuck in is a bit less definite. The race itself, which this year was called the Sebring 12 Hours of Endurance for the Alitalia Trophy, I suppose Pan Am sponsorship came a bit dear in those days, once again started at the traditional 10 a.m. takeoff. The Ferrari drivers also had the luxury of enjoying the benefits of the Alitalia Hospitality Trailer. The modern pit building with its upper-level suites had yet to be built, including showers and a rest area, and those spectators desiring a more genteel atmosphere could pay ten times the regular entry fee, or $100 a couple, to access the patron's enclosure in the paddock, supervised and hosted by Mrs. Ullman. Here, the well-heeled and well-connected could come to relax away from the hoi polloi of Green Park, and enjoy oysters, crab legs, rose duck, and the company of luminaries including the governor of Florida, also the honorary starter of the 1966 race. But there's no word on whether or not Mercury 7 astronauts Gus Grissom and Gordo Cooper returned after their attendance in 1965. However, while the Le Mans start endured, the countdown that we saw and heard in the 1965 video was no more replaced by a flag drop from the aforementioned governor, Hayden Burns. This year, the start went off without any issues, and as there were no Volvo P1800s on the grid like last year, nobody ran into the back of a Shelby Cobra in any form of prescient protest against Ford's acquisition of Volvo at the close of the century. However, as with last year, the Ford mechanics had overwarmed the engines on some of the cars, and it was the turn of pole sitter Dan Gurney's car to fail to start due to vapor lock. Although at the time it was presupposed that this was due to some other issue, perhaps due to Ford not wanting to admit, that this was a consistent issue with their vehicles. Let's go again to team strategist John Crowley to see how this may impact their plan for the race.
Uh, the number two car had difficulty in starting, Chris. Uh, they finally got it underway. I don't know whether Dan flooded it or what happened, but uh, it's going now, and I think you'll see him come up through the pack. What does this do to your planned strategy? We'll still bring Gurney to the front, we hope. Gurney's advanced to seventh in just 15 laps. He's averaging 105 miles per hour. The number 46 Ferrari Dino led the way off the start line, holding its position until halfway around the track when Graham Hill, having switched to a Ford this year, passed him driving one of the Allen Mann run GT40s. In his rush to start the race, he had managed to bend the top panel of the GT40's door so badly he could actually stick his hand through, but nevertheless he was making good time around the 5.2 mile or 8.37 kilometer circuit. Hap Sharp, in the faster of the two chaparrals, just managed to make it into the top 10 at the end of the first lap after the Comstock number 17 GT40 miscalculated the last turn. At the time it was turn 12, it's now turn 17, sunset bend, and plowed into a hay bale. The Comstock GT40s were, unfortunately, not in for a good race. Dan Gurney, meanwhile, had gotten his car started and was absolutely flying making up 27 positions on the first lap before making it to the faster cars of the field and having to be a bit more circumspect in his passes. The race's first retirement came on the first lap from a modified Corvair, entered as a Yenko Stinger, this video's name from the Scrapple Bag, which blew a piston while being driven by Donna Mae Mims. Despite breaking into the top 10 for a time, neither of the chaparrals could hang on to the pace at the front of the field, and the oil issues that had plagued the cars all weekend had the Joe Bonnier-driven number 12 car visiting pit lane rather quickly to take on a large amount of oil with less than an hour elapsed in the race. The trouble plague Chaparral team pits its number 12 car. This one was losing oil all through practice, and it looks like that's still the trouble for the defending champion. Two quarts this time, and the race barely started. That oil-stained rear deck, mute testimony to the trouble. Joe Bonnier is back out, but their chances are not good. After rejoining, it managed another half hour or so before retiring, the oil leak defying all attempts at remediation or repair. The other car would retire only eight laps later, on lap 35, with suspension failure. Let's check in with the Chaparral team for a little bit more insight. Well, we don't seem to be able to uh, build a closed car as well as we did the open cars that we campaigned here last year. The additional weight of the prototype uh, car, which is required by the rules, and uh, everything we have is designed for a lightweight automobile. We didn't think we'd be fast enough, but we thought uh, we thought we had our durability problems. Like a bitter disappointment for designer driver Jim Hall and the Chaparral team. Winners here last year, the Texas Roadrunners seemed restricted by the new international weight regulations. Let's get the word from Jim Hall. Jim, it must be a big disappointment for you. What knocked out the car? Well, se separate things, uh, Chris. We had engine trouble on one of them and uh, suspension trouble on the other. Jim, before the trouble set in, were you satisfied with the performance of the cars against the competition? Yes, we were. The cars, I think, uh, I think they're competitive in uh, in lap speeds, uh, both here and in and Daytona. Uh, this is a long race, and uh, we were satisfied with the speed we were running. Meanwhile. Dan Gurney continued to storm past his slower competitors, and by lap 44 found himself back at the head of the field to commence a battle with Ken Miles in the X1, with each passing and repassing each other as though it were the last lap of the race. Now, as any avid race fan, particularly uh, any frequent viewers of MX5 Cup will tell you, dueling at the front of the field just slows down those involved and inherently leads to accidents. Carol Shelby, clever chap that he is, also knew this and had someone go out with a pit board to tell the two to slow it the hell down. This request was, as one might expect, promptly and studiously ignored by both drivers who, if anything, turned up the wick in protest. But bosses don't like having their requests made light of, and Shelby himself climbed up on the pit wall after a few more laps armed with a knockoff hammer. In addition to being named for its use to remove the eared pieces that held wheels on at the time, in this instance it was also intended as a signal to Miles and Gurney to knock it off. 
This seemed to have the intended effect, perhaps because the drivers were afraid that the next target of the hammer might be their windshields or their skulls upon the end of their stint, and they dropped back to running three-minute lap times. Both of the Holman Moody prepared GT40s had struggled with braking issues from the beginning of the race, but were still running. While the Sutcliffe entered GT retired with a blown engine, a head gasket failure to be specific, that also nearly took out the Allen Mann entered GT driven by Jackie Stewart when, headed down into the hairpin, it spun on the oil slick left by the Sutcliffe car and the rear burst into flames, likely due to oil thrown up onto either overheated brakes or the engine block. Fortunately, Stuart had a fire extinguisher in the car and managed to get back to the pits safely, eventually handing over the car to Graham Hill, who would retire on lap 142, also with engine issues. Up to this point, the rate of attrition on track had been high, and of the 64 cars entered, ultimately only 24 would finish within the race classification required distance. Unfortunately, and I do apologize for the discomforting nature of the upcoming footage, dear viewer, and encourage any of you to skip ahead uh, who are sensitive to such things, probably about one or two minutes, but it was shortly after the midpoint of the race that Bob McLean, driving GT40 chassis number one, or serial number P1000, and run by the Comstock team in this race, left the pits after taking overdriving duties from Jean Oulette. With a full fuel load, newly replaced brakes, and new tires, he lost control of his car on approach to the hairpin. Locking the rear brakes and entering a spin that sent the car off track, into a ditch and barrel rolling into a telephone pole, which hit one of the fuel cells mounted on the left-hand side of the vehicle next to the driver. As a reminder, the GT40s were right-hand drive cars. Still rolling, and with fuel spinning everywhere, this uh, the car burst into flames before landing on its top, with Bob McLean trapped inside. The nearby fire truck was only loaded with water and therefore unable to adequ adequately extinguish the gasoline fire, especially after the lightweight magnesium wheels and certain chassis components caught fire. Though the lessons about putting water on magnesium fires had happily been learned from the 1955 Le Mans disaster the previous decade, and further deaths or serious injury were avoided <laughs> from pouring water on the blaze, it took a long time for marshals and safety workers to get the fire under control while police struggled to contain the onlookers, resulting in several tents and at least one physically violent interaction between police and a photographer who got too close to the accident. The second Comstock GT40, as traditional, was withdrawn shortly thereafter as the magnitude of the accident became apparent. Bob McLean was only 32 at the time, and well-liked in racing circles for his talent, work ethic, and, and dedication to the sport, known for working on his own cars, an admirable trait at any point, and taking any ride that came his way as long as it meant track time. The uh, chassis was buried nearby after the race where it allegedly remains to this day. Ford and Ferrari split the top four spots of the race at the time, and continued to do so for several hours, with a Porsche 906 driven by Don Wester and Scooter Patrick in fifth. Not terribly long after the Comstock GT40 incident, and with darkness having fallen, further tragedy struck when the 906, with Wester at the wheel, lost traction and spun off the track along the warehouse straight. This by itself would not have been the worst thing in the world, assuming Mr. Wester avoided any buildings, but four spectators, taking a shortcut to access a different part of the track, had wandered into an area that was considered off-limits, and therefore was not effectively separated from the track itself. One must remember that in those days it was still largely just paved runways, nominally marked out as a race course, and most of the rest of the year, significant portions of the track were used as access roads, runways, and industrial areas. Well, these four people were unfortunately in the path of the out-of-control Porsche and were killed as it spun and impacted either the side of a warehouse or the side of another telephone pole. Reports differ. Based on the photographs of the Porsche from after the race, shown here, 
My assumption would be an impact against the side of a warehouse, but I am by no means an expert in crash analysis. Mr. Wester was knocked unconscious by the crash, perhaps uh, unsurprisingly given the photo shown here, and came to only as he was being cut out of the ruined car by two others that happened to be nearby, perhaps other spectators or more presumably marshals sent to look for the missing Porsche. There is no universally accepted course of act events that caused the Porsche's loss of control, but an idea started to form several laps after the incident, when the North American racing team Ferrari, driven by Mario Andretti, came into the pits with a badly damaged front end. Another of the Ferrari cars having trouble. Mario, you brought the car in with a front end damage. What happened out there? Uh, the gearbox selector just broke, and... Uh... I tried to shift into third from fourth, and then went into first, locked the rear wheels, and uh, hit a, I think it was a sandbank, and knocked all the lights out. As we just saw Mr. Andretti report, he claims the Ferrari allegedly hit a sandbank after the car's shift gate broke, causing him to miss shift and spin the car, but there is at least a general modern consensus that what he instead hit was the back end of the 906 after it had passed him following that misshift. Wester was, according to an interview some years later, hit on the left rear quarter panel by the fishtailing Ferrari, lost control, locked the brakes, and careened off into the night, a timeline that was allegedly confirmed by race officials very shortly after the race. I'm not here to cast aspersions one way or the other, and Mr. Andretti claims to have had no racing contact with the Porsche in question, and I will leave it at that. The death of anyone at a race is a tragedy, and substantial press criticism was leveled, not without cause, at the race officials and organizers at the time for the incompleteness of their safety preparations in regard to both incidents at the event. Regardless of the apportionment of responsibility, it was widely acknowledged by those involved with the Andretti North American Racing Team car that it was not in top condition following its outing at Daytona several months before and had not been adequately prepared to get it ready for its Sebring outing, possibly due to the expectation of taking delivery of a new 330p3 before the race. In spite of both accidents, the race remained under green flag running, and the top four remained essentially unchanged until around nine and a half hours into the race, when the second-placed P3 of Bob Bondurant failed to come into the pits for its scheduled stop. Radios were still something of a rarity in those days, despite the first ap application coming over a decade before on Briggs Cunningham's Cadillac mentioned earlier, and all the factory team could really do was wait and hope that some ill fate had not befallen Mr. Bondurant or the hopes of the Marinello team. It was therefore with a sigh of relief, particularly given the events of the day, when Bob slowly returned to the pits, but unexpectedly arriving from the back entrance, courtesy of uh, borrowing a lift from a kindly spectator on their scooter. The car, up till that point in contention for the win, was out yet again close to the hairpin with a seized gearbox. Mike, it's very unusual for a leading Ferrari to go out at Sebring. What happened? Well, it was quite a surprise to me, too, actually, because uh, we usually try and make our cars to last. Um, actually, the car lost second gear, and uh, from then on it just got rather difficult to change gear, and finally got stuck in one gear, and, and uh, it couldn't, Bob couldn't drive it anymore. At this point, Ford's GTs were essentially unopposed in their pursuit of victory, another 1-2-3 finish was guaranteed with another in fourth besides, which foreshadowed their Le Mans result later that year and recalled their Daytona success from January. Some contemporaneous journalists were calling this a walkover in the true Mercedes style, and quote, recalling the dominance that they had shown in the previous decade and in the pre-war period, especially when one Consider the next closest vehicle at the 66 race, the Porsche 906 of Hans Hermann, Joe Buzetta, and Gerhard Mitter, was a huge 19 laps of field of Dan Gurney's leading car. Carol, earlier in the day we checked with you and you thought the strategy at that time was going real good. Now, with just moments, uh, let's say, away from the finish line, uh, things look awfully good. Yes, they look uh, a lot better than they did earlier, even yeah. when we're running one two three. But 
while the misfortune fairies, by all metrics, should certainly have been appeased, fate had one final kick in the teeth prepared for the race participants. The remainder of the race proceeded smoothly for the Ford teams, right up until the final six minutes of the race. Despite the Goodyear blimp already declaring him a winner, the GT40 Mark II, piloted by Dan Gurney, in the lead with one lap in hand over the Ken Miles X1, came to a shuddering halt on what is now the Ullman Strait, his timing chain broken. In spite of regulations, and perhaps in a show of what he hoped would someday be executive authority, he got out of the car and started to push it around the final straight and turn, despite being lapped twice by Miles for position and the overall win, only to have his hard work negated due to precedent established by an incident in which he, ironically himself, had featured at the Daytona Continental back in 1962. He won that race by using the starter motor in his car to crawl across the finish line, having experienced another engine failure shortly before the finish line, some minutes before the end of the race, but with such a lead that it was irrelevant as long as he crossed the finish line after the checkered flag flew. After proving, under Stord's inquiry guidelines, that he finished under power rather than by using gravity and the banking of the track to glide into the finish, it was ruled that races had to be completed solely under a car's own power, and thus the quarter-mile slog that Gurney undertook served no point but to put right his conscience as the act of pushing the car at all was an act meriting disqualification. Had he not been disqualified, and even without the additional lap for pushing the car, he would have been qualified in second, but it was not to be. We don't know what happened at this point, but Miles is driving into victory lane to accept the crown, the apparent winner of this action-filled classic. And obviously elated but surprised, Miles enjoys the victory lane hubbub, while everyone wonders what happened to Gurney. Provisional results show him second, Walt Hanskin third, Skip Scott fourth, first sports, four Porsches in the top ten, the winner Steen Moore Stingray first GT. Victory Lane and the Gurney story after this word. Ken Miles and Lloyd Ruby and, of course, the beauty queens. Ken Miles, are you as surprised as we are? I'm slightly ashamed. Well, it was a big day for Ford, wasn't it? It was a good day for Ford. I'm very happy for the Ford Motor Company. I'm very sorry indeed for that. He really deserved to win the race. He drove a beautiful race, and I saw that something happened to the last minute. How did Lloyd go for you? This is your third big long-distance win together, isn't it? I like that, Lloyd. What's next for you? Le Mans. How about the strategy, Ken, as you stay with your plan throughout the day? Yeah, we just drove it the way we thought the car should go. Did you feel that? Did you taste that P3 very much? No trouble. No trouble. No. Let me have a word with Lloyd Ruby over here. Yeah, Congratulations, man. Lloyd. Are you as surprised as we are? We really are. I mean, I was already, already cleaned up and everything. I thought we had second made, and then you never know on them last laps. That's right. Well, let's continue. Good luck to you all. Nevertheless, the true capability of the GT40 had finally been proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, with Ford still taking a clean sweep of the podium and setting themselves well for the upcoming showdown with Ferrari on that greatest of world endurance races, Le Mans. At that greatest of world endurance races, or on that greatest of world endurance stages. Recording these things is a little bit tiring sometimes. Apart from a brief epilogue that will follow this conclusion, depending on how you wish to leave the story, dear viewers, that brings us to the end of this race report. As always, thank you ever so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I hope you'll join us again soon for another video. Stay well, and in the spirit of this video and memoriam for those lost, stay safe. Epilogue the race and its organizers were, in the aftermath of the race, excoriated for the death of a racer and four spectators, despite the joy of the press at an American manufacturer's sweep of the podium. Legislators even got on board, terrors that they are, and some promised to enact broad-ranging safety measures for sporting events the state and country over to ensure that nobody ever came to harm ever again. Yeah, right. Well, at this point it looked like it might be the end for the Sebring Grand Prix of Endurance, as Mr. Allman received a very generous offer from the owners and managers of Palm Beach International Raceway, which is contradictorily located in Jupiter rather than Palm Beach. They're that far apart, but it's worth mentioning. 
who offered to help him move his 12-hour race back to Palm Beach, where it had been first held in 1949, before moving to the comparatively unpeopled Sebring area. This offer included the expansion of Palm Beach International Raceway to five and a half miles, similar to the length of the Sebring circuit at the time, featuring a whopping 20 hairpins just to make it extra challenging on drivers' gearboxes. 80 pit stalls were, were proposed, as well as spectator facilities and a scenic lake for some reason. And the first race was proposed to take place the following year on the 1st of April. Well, given that date choice, it seems that fate is not without a further sense of irony, because no sooner had all the T's been dotted and the I's crossed that one day it started raining, and it didn't quit for four months. This, of course, meant that it was impossible to make any material progress on the proposed improvements, and as a result, the contract was terminated in mid-November, leaving Mr. Ullman and the Sebring organizers a bit in the lurch, but at least they knew there was a racetrack at Sebring. A flurry of rapidly improvised safety improvements came thereafter, both in the form of rule and track layout changes. Spectators were required to be further away from the track than previous, Chain-link fencing and Armco barriers were now mandatory, and the warehouse straight was moved to an adjacent road, with the Webster turn replaced by a high-speed chicane, bringing us just that little bit closer to the track that we know and love today. Thanks again for watching.